The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The views, information, or opinions expressed by hosts or guests are their own. Neither the show nor any of its content should be construed as investment advice or as a recommendation to buy or sell any particular security. Security-specific information shared on this podcast should not be relied upon as a basis for your own investment decisions. Be sure to do your own research. The podcast hosts and participants may have a position in the securities mentioned personally through sub-accounts and or through separate funds and may change their holdings at any time. Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investing topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here's your host, John Michalczewicz. Welcome, everyone, to this new episode of This Week in Intelligent Investing. Great to have you with us and great to welcome my co-hosts, Phil Ordway and Elliot Turner. We have a great uh, discussion ahead. Elliot, uh, why don't you kick it off for us, please? Thanks, John. So this week, um, we actually received an idea suggestion from a listener. Greatly appreciated. The idea was to discuss David Einhorn's recent interview. It's uh, brief and we'll include it in the show notes on uh, his point that value investing is dead and he's not sure it will come back. And he makes a couple uh, points to highlight why he thinks that's the case, including the fact that quants and systematic strategies are overwhelming the market and have become dominant sources of investing funds. Funds. He's spoken. Uh, he spoke about how passive investing is now huge, and there's a lot less active investing in the market. And he explained how formerly you'd be able to buy something for like a low double-digit PE uh, with double-digit growth. And within six months or so, you'd get a re-rating of like three turns of multiple alongside capturing the growth in between and get a pretty nice return, move on to the next idea, rinse, wash, repeat. Now, if that sounds a little too easy, well, maybe it's because it was and some of the competition that had come in from other value investors trying to do the same thing had chiseled that away. Um, but you know, I would beg to differ with Einhorn's point. And I think there is broader point about value investing being dead. I think it's somewhat ironic, the timing, given the fact that value investing this year has outperformed growth investing. So I know no one takes solace in losing less money than their neighbor, um, but there's something to be said about how value as a strategy, when you look purely quantitatively, has actually had a better year. But I do think he has some really good points embedded in there. I think there has been this massive proliferation of these systematic strategies that are tied to things that have nothing to do with actual intrinsic value. And these strategies have become very big. And I think in a certain way, they overwhelm the market itself. And that's high level. So flows are less driven by, you know, I want to allocate to this pocket of the market that's cheap and more driven by, oh, I'll allocate to passive. Passive will be allocated within the strategy proportionate to where someone thinks, uh, to, to what the pie is already divided like, rather than to something discriminant within that pie about you know cheap and expensive, uh, getting their respective share of what they deserve. And so I, I think some of those forces are very real. And beyond that, I also think within fundamental investors, there's been this really big shift um, to different kinds of fundamental approaches. And by that, I mean, I think there's an increasingly large uh, pool of fundamental people who call themselves fundamental analysts. I don't want to be too facetious, but fundamental analysts who focus a lot more on like very high frequency data and what the uh, directional trends in data are rather than on intrinsic value per se. Perhaps they use the data as an input in intrinsic value, but there's like 
repeatedly an over-extrapolation problem based on the latest trajectory of the data. And that's always been a, like over-extrapolation's always been a feature, not a bug of equity investing. Um, however, I think it's become even more pronounced as the proliferation of and, and the, the acceleration and frequency of data points um, has become the norm. And so um, to the extent that all those things are true, um, yeah, Einhorn's got uh, a, a pretty strong point there. And I think one more thing that used to happen is I know one of my mentors uh, who, who helped train me very early in this industry a decade ago, his MO was always look at um, sectors where there are a lot of companies who formerly have narrow dispersion in value and currently have very wide dispersion in value and bet on mean reversion of the spread between another. So there might be company A trading at a 10 PE, Company B trading at a 17 PE, typically they have three points between them. So you buy uh, company A, short company B, and you don't need a full reversion in value. And you make a pretty good living doing that over and over without all that much risk. Um, that mentor you know, trained me, uh, it was 14 years ago. And I think if you look at today's market, one of the things that's happened over the last decade is in many of those situations, that spread has actually increased rather than narrowed because the winners have really won over the last decade and the losers have tended to lose. Um, so all these are problems. But you know, at the top, I said, I actually don't think value investing is dead. Um, and I think that's partly because uh, I, I do think to a degree, Einhorn's been one of the more I don't want to use the wrong words, but one one of the one of those who's been less eager to embrace certain kinds of growth. I remember uh, maybe it was like eight years ago or so when Einhorn was short Amazon, and you know the the thesis was primarily about valuation itself, very little on the the quality of the business, on the opportunities to grow, and now. Many could quibble with how far people have taken the notion that companies can invest in growth without cash flow and profitability in order to drive very big uh, long-term gains. But I think no one would quibble with the idea that even eight years ago, were you to apply a pretty modest multiple on the Amazon of today, the returns would have been fantastic. And so I do think there's a class of those kinds of companies where you had to think differently about them. And so maybe that, you know, oh, extrapolation being a feature, not a bug of asset, uh, of equity investing, that's been taken too far. But I do think there are different ways that people have had to find value in the market today. And I do think it's clear that, you know, over time, regimes of what work within the definition of value investing has to change. I think Ben Graham changed his strategy quite a bit over time. In the end, he wasn't a cigar butt investor either. Um, Buffett, you know, himself, I think has evolved several times through his career and has focused on uh, different kinds of value and creating value in different ways. Um, so I think it's more about how value investing is inherently an evolutionary endeavor. And I think much like with fashion, sometimes what's old becomes new again and what's new becomes old. Um, but, you know, you keep something in your closet long enough, it's going to it's gonna work uh, again one day. But there are still certain tried and true principles that I don't think have ever left the markets. So with that intro uh, underway, curious what you guys think. Is value investing dead? What do you think's changed? What do you think's not changed? Yeah, I... The thing I struggled about with this interview was that I wholeheartedly agreed with most of the major points. And I bet that if we could sit down and agree to a list of terms and definitions in advance, we'd probably agree almost across the board. And then it would be really boring because everyone would agree that this is a really kind of stupid and arbitrary debate at the core of it. Like anytime somebody starts getting too worked up about the difference between value and growth and they trot out the Russell growth or the Russell 2000 value, whatever. And you start thinking about what those definitions and what those indices entail and how arbitrary they are and just how 
silly the whole thing is, you know, it starts to make your head hurt. I mean, look, one of the the most important part of value investing, and by that I mean the discipline with a lowercase v that was started by Ben Graham and carried on through the ages, is that you have to look to the business itself. You have to look to the underlying results of the commercial enterprise, period, full stop. The stock market is there to serve you, not to be your master. And so that was kind of thrown in as an aside at the end of the interview, where he said, like, you know, we can't just buy stuff at eight times, 10 times earnings, have earnings surprise to the upside a little bit, watch the multiple re-rate higher, and then we sell at 50% higher three years down the road. We can't do that game anymore. Now we're buying stuff at three or four times earnings, which I kind of doubt is really that much more prevalent now than it was at any prior period. But he's saying we have to rely on the business itself to be its own catalyst. And so, yeah, my, my response is like, well, that's always what value investing has been. It's always been about the business itself being its own catalyst. It's always been about what the business is capable of doing in the future and all of the cash flows it's going to produce in the future discounted back to a current value that makes sense to you ranked against your opportunity cost. And so nothing has changed there. And if you're doing that and you're considering the other, you know, two key tenants of the of the discipline, which are only doing it when you have a margin of safety and room to be wrong, and only doing it when the market is, you know, there to serve you and you're not taking direction from the market, you know, I don't I, I don't see how that could ever be dead. I don't see how that could ever go out of style. It's never going to matter. And you know, it it just it, it it's it's irrelevant because look, the other things that I think he left out were, so look, yes, I, I guess I'll step back real quickly though. Cause I do agree. The market structure has totally changed. And I assume that he's referring more to the entire arc of his own career, which if you think back to the environment in which he started in the 1990s, you know, hedge funds were still a relatively novel concept back then you know, Bear Stearns paid to put him into business. He wasn't competing against lots of other firms. So I think it was interesting that he didn't mention that along with all these market structure changes that hedge funds went from nothing to, you know, proliferating like crazy for the next 10 and 20 years. And the competition went way up and the access to information went way up and market inefficiencies went way down. I think that's a far bigger story than you know, anything else that was, that was mentioned about the structural changes except for passive. But again, like, I I don't think the, the rise of passive over that period has really had quite as much to do with it as a lot of people would make it out to be. Look, passive has had an enormous influence. It's a much bigger deal in the arena of corporate governance and kind of what it means for business writ large and society writ large than it is for whether or not you're going to have the same results you had back in the day. I mean, it, it matters. I just don't think it matters as a lot of the, as much as these other factors do. And, and yes, he's also 100% correct that if you compare today versus 10, 15 years ago, there are probably fewer valuation-oriented analysts and funds out there, quote unquote, value style funds, just because the last 10 years have been so brutal. You know, the, the peak, and again, this is pertinent to his career, uh, maybe not so much to mine. I wasn't around for that heyday, but the absolute heyday for this style of investing would have been, you know, if you could have survived and, and avoided the the melt up in the dot-com wave that crested in 2000, the real heyday for this strategy was 2000 into the financial crisis, right? That five, six years there after the dot-com bubble burst when, you know, lower priced assets were doing phenomenally well and and you just had amazing opportunities. I mean, we still hear on almost a daily basis from members of that, you know, cohort of funds that, you know, where the managers made huge amounts of money, gathered a staggering amount of assets and really made their reputations. And so look, it, yeah, from that is the high watermark, then yes, everything has declined in the sense that there are fewer valuation focused funds and analysts out there. But I I don't think, you know, there's less attention paid to quarterly earnings conference calls. I don't think it really matters at all. Like I said, I mean, those conference calls are usually 99.5% of the time a waste of time. And so I don't think it matters at all if there's fewer people participating on them. And I'm not sure there are. And to the extent that it was always dominated by sell-side analysts, it's still dominated by sell-side analysts and and pretty much a waste of time. And and like I said, I mean, the, 
the dominant factor here is that information, particularly compared to 15 or 20 years ago, is now completely ubiquitous. It's almost free in every case, or it's it's free in the sense that everyone has access to the same information in real time. And that's a much, much bigger deal. Um, so the, the last point I'd make, and I'll, I'll circle back on a couple of these after we hear, I'm going to hear what John has to say about this too, is that I, I don't think I quite agree with the statement he made that nobody knows what anything is worth. And he said that in the context of the decline of um, you, you know, the valuation focused analysts and funds we were just talking about. I don't think it's so much that. I don't think it's that nobody knows what anything it's worth. I think that for a, a distressingly large amount of time over the past, call it five years, nobody cared what anything was worth. So I don't think it's that nobody knows. I just think nobody cared. And everybody kind of in, in a couple of different flavors, whether it was, you know, these crazy, you know, 30, 40, 50 times revenue companies, or whether it was the meme stock nonsense that we saw and the day trading resurgence of nonsense that we saw. I just think it was more nobody cared about what anything was worth more than anybody, you know, didn't know what it was worth or didn't didn't even try to figure out what it was worth, if that makes sense. So I'll, I'll stop there. But yeah, maybe I'll jump in with a few thoughts um, as well. I think it's easy to get into semantics here, and that doesn't really um, bring us a whole lot of value. Um, you know, and and the market ebbs and flows, so it's impossible to say this or that will never come back. And you know, as Elliot said, value is already coming back this year, and uh, and and it's it's an approach that will always make sense uh, if you're paying less than something is worth. That's not going to go out of style. And, um, you know, to the extent that there are um, more companies that are deeply undervalued, as, as Einhorn said, three or four times earnings, and that's not just a cyclical uh, high uh, that's going to go away, those companies can actually create a lot of value by buying back their own undervalued stock. So you don't really need to play the, um, you know, the the Keynesian beauty contest where other investors are going to bid it up for you if a company can just cannibalize its own shares um, at at a great price, then the remaining shareholders are going to do extremely well. And I think maybe what Einhorn was kind of referring to when he said the structure had changed uh, and, and value as he knows it may not come back is that if I remember correctly, um, you know, he was also playing the relative value game a lot. Um, you know, just thinking back to a lot of the um, green light letters I've read, it was a lot of the time, you know, this business trades at, you know, eight or 10 times earnings, it deserves 12 to 15 times. And, you know, maybe that kind of a relative value game uh, worked better, um, you know, 10 or 20 years ago than it does today. Um, but that doesn't mean that value investing doesn't work because value has always been kind of, you know, trying to stay away from the beauty contest of trying to guess what other market participants will do and actually just, um, you know, owning partial interest in real life businesses for the long term and getting paid for you know the businesses um, growing their intrinsic value and having smart capital allocation. And just one other point uh, I want to make before I turn it back to you guys on this notion, and this is kind of a pretty... I have the impression that a lot of people subscribe to this kind of because they're so much passive that that's made it harder for active investors somehow. Um, and that I, I just don't see the logic in that because to me, passive means by definition, dumb money, you know, and if you are a poker player, you want a lot of dumb money at the table. You're not going to say, oh, well, now I have to become like the dumb money in order to beat the dumb money. That's not, that's not how it works. Um, so if you are actually a really good active investor, you should welcome even more passive strategies, even more dumb money in the market, because that's going to provide opportunities. And you can then have the company be the catalyst, you can be your own catalyst, there's many ways to make money. But 
to say that because there's more dumb money in the market, it's gotten harder for the smart money. It just it doesn't seem very logical to me. Back to you guys. Yeah, I really like the poker point too, because if you draw that out a little further, it's like in poker, um, the dumb money at the table, like they could win for a long period of time. And you just have to be patient and wait it out. Um, so a lot of it comes down to patience, 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 like over time. So with a long enough time frame, you know, that works. It's great that it used to work in six months, but um, that was almost too easy. And, uh, you know, this idea that you have to rely on the business be its own catalyst. I like that uh, today. And, but I, I don't think that's any less true today. Uh, we had Mario Sabelli on the podcast talking about his experiences in the early 2000s. And there were a lot of companies who catalyzed things themselves because the market gave them the signal to uh, in the wake of the dot com bust. And I think that gets to another point, which is that from 2000 to 2010, the companies that were distinctly in value land, whether it be they were trading for below their um, or, or close to their tangible assets, to those companies that were trading uh, at very low PEs, they were very different than the kinds of companies who are trading in that same ballpark from 10, 2010 to 2020. Um, so you went from having a bunch of technology companies that were still growing, um, some retailers that were doing just fine. Um, you know, uh, some orphaned uh, IPOs that were in various industries to 2010 to 2020, it was like almost entirely financials and uh, commodity companies. And the same rules of value investing don't necessarily apply to when and how financial and commodity companies are cheap versus, I think, more uh, uh, normal kinds of businesses. So, I mean, there's certainly value in each, but but they uh, look and act very differently when they're distinctly in value camp. And I do think um, today we're kind of back to the kinds of companies from 2000 to 2010 being cheap relative to other things. And there are increasingly companies uh, that are trading at or near their tangible asset values that are very real businesses. Um, some of them may not be making money per se today, though that's largely a choice. And so one thing companies can do to uh, be their own catalyst to say, hey, let's make the rational, smart choice and do what the market's telling us to do right now. Um, so maybe we're going, uh, you know, back to the way things used to be. I think there's probably some truth to that that we're going back to the way things used to be in some regard. Just I'd probably put a slightly different spin on it though, which is that I think if you look at again, let's say the majority of Greenlight's existence, which I believe started in 1996. Does that sound right? I think it was somewhere around there. Um, but you know, for the majority of that period of time, you were dealing with some sort of anomalous crisis, right? I mean, shortly thereafter, you went into the dot-com boom and bust. Then you went into 9-11. Then you went into the financial crisis. Then you had you know, a 10-year interregnum between the recovery from the worst of the financial crisis and COVID. But along the whole way, or not the whole way, but the majority of the way, you had close to zero interest rates for a lot of that period of time, right? So there was a huge premium on these companies that had the reinvestment opportunities to make outsized returns that, you know, maybe they were plausible, maybe they weren't, but they certainly looked attractive, right? They were they were outgrowing anything else in a low growth environment where the opportunity cost you know the absolute opportunity cost of of interest rates was very very low so it was kind of like this triple dip i mean we talked about this a little bit with the the buffett conversation about how equity investors get swindled by inflation and it was the triple dip of you know the the starting returns were higher than interest rates the reinvestment opportunity looked way more attractive than anything else you could get out there in the market and then the multiple went up Right, so that that happened to quote unquote growth assets for a long period of time over this period, and, and I agree that is not normal. That may not happen, but again, like you know, these super weird conditions, like they can go on for a long time. They can come back in waves. Like I wouldn't want to place a huge bet on that, um, other than just noting that it was weird and abnormal, and you know, you had crazy periods of speculation and all sorts of other weird stuff going on. So. I get it that you know we shouldn't expect that to persist, but it it 
it doesn't mean that, you know, whatever happened before, like uh, there were long periods of craziness that happened before too. And, and sometimes it's to the flip side where everything looks cheap and nothing looks like it's going to get better. And uh, that's not really that much fun either. So it's, it's, it's just hard to make big pronouncements about it. Right. Yeah. And you know, one of the things I think about too, is like, okay, maybe he's just making that pronouncement to be provocative and not necessarily because he believes it. Because if you look at how he invests, I'd say it's probably not all that differently than how he invested. Um, so if you really did believe value investing were dead and it's something you were like putting your flag down in the ground, wouldn't you at least be, I don't know, doing things differently today than you were uh, in the past? Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, I I never try to ascribe motivations or... I, it, it's just hard to know. I, I don't know what, you know, second or third dimension he could have been operating in there. I mean, yeah, I agree though. Like you would think that if things were really dead, there'd be some change that you'd spur, but yeah, it doesn't seem like that's the case. And yeah, I don't know. It, it's, it's tough to really suss out what he, what he would be getting at there other than I, I would assume his answer would be, uh, and given benefit of the doubt, and they would say it was all in, in good faith. Was that like, oh well, we're the last of the Mohicans. Like, we're never going to change because these principles make sense. And if you don't see it that way, great, that's fine, good for you. But we're not, we're not going to change. We're not going to fold at the last hour because that'd be the worst mistake we could make, right? That would that would be my guess as to what he would say. Yeah, and I know what we saw was incomplete, but like a lot of uh, tried and true value investors that have stuck with the same strategy, much like Einhorn have been insistent that today's regime is a return to what had worked in the past. So perhaps that was part of the point he was maybe alluding to, though I'm obviously putting words into his mouth with that. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'd have to go back and look at what some of the numbers would imply. But like anecdotally, the few investors like him that are, you know, let's say his strategy hasn't really changed all that much through, I guess he's up. Am I reading this right? It looks like he was up 17.7% through the end of September this year. Uh, yeah, that looks like the number, right? I'm looking at his letter from right now. So that's obviously very impressive and stands out like a sore thumb because I think a lot of these other funds have declined sort of in lockstep with the market, right? And I, I would guess in his case, the short book has just been a complete home run. In in 2022, I don't know. Again, I have not dug into his results and returns, but um, I don't think this is quite identical to the dot com run up. So, like you you suffered through that pain in the late 90s, and then the wave crested in in 2000, and then it was just absolute salad days for funds like that. And the ensuing four, five, six years, I, I I would hesitate to make that comparison directly, even though there are a lot of similarities. Obviously, things got crazy. Things got expensive. There was rampant speculation, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think that there are enough differences between then and now, namely, you know, the macro environment, you know, the natural disaster we just went through, you know, the geopolitical environment that's out there, the general level of asset prices that we still see in the market that make me think that that's an interesting historical parallel, but nothing like a playbook that you can replicate, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, a couple of points from me. I mean, he does. Einhorn does say in that in that interview that um, they that he and and other investors like himself face less competition today. Uh, that's true, and that's a good thing, right? That should make it easier for him to operate. Um, and another point. Um, I want to make as a value investor myself, you know, one of my biggest fears was sort of being left behind um, if it really is the case that we're in this new paradigm with, you know, winner take all in every market and companies are just going to have these incredibly long growth runways where the starting valuation really doesn't matter as much. Um, and so I am the kind of investor who would have missed out on on all of those kinds of companies. And I think actually what this year has done is kind of alleviated some of those fears um, that I've had as a value investor because we're 
actually finally seeing that valuation does matter. And, um, you know, you have a lot of these companies that are, that were seen as super high quality companies down 80 plus percent in a lot of cases, um, you know, both because it was silly to pay the kinds of prices um, for those companies that people were paying, assuming they were going to grow forever and have these unassailable business models. And B, we're seeing like from the business side that they're actually in a lot of cases, growing a lot more slowly than was uh, expected and maybe don't have uh, the kind of moats that will allow them to extract, you know, super normal profits um, far into the future. In fact, a lot of these companies, the only reason they've been able to grow is because, you know, they've kind of sacrificed profitability. And now, it's not that easy to turn on profitability and maintain growth. So, you know, this this whole notion that forget all old economy companies because this is a brave new world and therefore value investing is dead, to me, you know, that's really, that notion has suffered a huge setback and that's good for value investing. Yeah, I, I should have mentioned, John, there's two great points there. The first one you mentioned, which is that if we want to buy this thesis that passive has gone way up and it's all dumb money, that that should be a good thing. I agree. Like That's usually my first response to people when they start bitching and moaning about, you know, Vanguard did this and State Street did that and blah, blah, blah. Like It's not something you should complain about if you're an active manager who's making your own investment decisions and looking at things through a value investing type of framework. I don't think we're anywhere near that point yet, by the way. I think we have a long way to go and we might well get there in our lifetime, but I think passive would have to come become quite a bit bigger than it is currently to really become such a distorting factor in the market that that would really be a super valid argument. But, you know, again, I think also what what you just said another point that's really good is that it's it's hard. Like it's really hard to have a company grow as quickly as a lot of the expectations were embedded in the prices we're suggesting in recent years and, and even in the past decade or so. And I think people got kind of lulled to sleep by this notion of pulling an, pulling an Amazon, right? Kind of what you just described, where it's like, all right, I'm going to take this business in a relatively small niche, you know, whatever it is, usually software tech enabled. I'm going to ignore for the better part of some period of time, you know, a few years, maybe a decade, I'm going to kind of ignore headline profitability and gap profitability to reinvest in this great business. And then at the end of it, we're all going to wake up and I'm going to have this world beating dominant position. And then I can turn up the profit you know, dial a little bit and everybody's going to go home happy. And look, that's great. And Amazon's one of the great achievements and accomplishments in the history of the world, but it's not that easy to do. right? And for the last 5, 10, 15 years, you've had a handful of companies pull that off and everybody kind of applied that playbook to the rest of the world and thought everybody could do it. And that's just total fantasy, right? That's just not going to happen. Yeah. I'll take that last bit one step further and move us a little farther from where we started, which is that um, over the last few years, one of the big problems is you went from some companies rightly saying, hey, we have a very long runway and we can invest and not earn profits and give better outcomes to our shareholders to a whole bunch of what I'd call pretender companies who weren't making any underlying profits, saying they were investing for profitability and value me like those other guys over there who did it so successfully. Um, and those pretenders have put even the ones who legitimately have the right in the same position as them. And that's why a lot of, you know, like John said, uh, you know, what everyone thought were great companies down 80%. Well, you know, uh, everyone gets painted with the same brush once too many pretenders come in. And so the obligation, what the market's saying to those companies who are honestly investing in a great opportunity, like, hey, show us some profitability right now. Prove that you're able to be profitable. And then, you know, once you re earn that trust, um, you could probably go back to investing the same way you had before. Uh, Modest Proposal has this great tweet um, from even a couple years ago about how Amazon 
didn't even always just invest, invest, invest. Well, his, his, his quote was that they'd always show a little leg of profitability. They'd always show <laughs> the market that, yeah, we can actually you know, make money. And they would do it like periodically. And by periodically, I mean, it was somewhat often, you know, maybe every other year they'd be like, hey, look, we can actually, you know, make real money if we so choose. And now that we did, um, these are some areas we're going to invest and we're going to go do it. Um, And so I think that's what some of these companies lost track of too. You know, if you just keep investing without showing any profitability, you might hit a day where your investor base, even if they really like you, starts questioning, uh, you know, are these guys really telling me the truth? Are they really profitable or are they not? Especially when too many truly pretenders are doing it at the same time. And I'm guilty as charged for like overstaying my welcome in some of these, but that's where we're at right now. I think um, that makes for a great opportunity set. What I'm getting at is there's going to be incredible dispersion from here because the pretenders are going to go way down. Like those were never profitable companies. They invested way too much money. But there were absolutely babies thrown out with the bathwater. And if you don't believe that, if you think everyone's a pretender, you're just as wrong as the people who overstayed their welcome in these things, because there are some really, really good companies out there. Um, and it might not be easy to figure out which ones are which. Um, and it might be as simple as saying, hey, I'm going to wait to see which ones show me profitability because they're down so damn much that I'd rather buy them like 30% higher than end up in one of these pretenders who's going to be down another 80% from here. Fine. But, you know, be on the lookout because babies are out with the bathwater here. Yeah. And I, I agree, by the way, that that's a huge differentiator is like Amazon would always show a little leg, which is true that that's, it's very, it's a great point, but even more important than that point, I think was that the whole thing was self-financed. There are just so many businesses that were put into that same bucket of don't worry about valuation. Don't worry about profitability because the total addressable market is X and here are some tortured calculations of unit level economics that are just so awesome. Again, not not to beat my favorite dead horse, but we're going to have a Peloton subscriber that stays around for 13 years, like all this kind of nonsense. And it was like, yeah, that's great, but you're burning a ton of cash and this will never work on the time horizon that anyone's going to care about. And so, you know, again, like if some of these businesses, it was purely just about the valuation, that'd be one thing, but the business never worked either. It was never self-financing. It was never self-sustained. So, but you know, again, I guess back to the original point, like, okay, so we overdid it maybe a little bit in that direction. And by we, I mean like the whole zeitgeist and the market and whatever. But I, I, I do agree that like the glory days of 2003, four, five, or if that's what we mean by value investing is dead, I, I agree with that because I just don't think that's coming back. I mean, did, do you guys agree or do you see like a, a renaissance of that style of investing that's actually going to come back into vogue? Well, can I add one more thing to what's changed? Like a lot of these guys, the the value investors of that era were long short investors. And there was something, there was something, and there now is something again called the short rebate. So you'd buy something, yeah. short something against it, and you could park the the cash from the short and earn, you know, the treasury rate. <laughs> and when that's five percent, that's not bad. And then when you're you know, kind of gross is 200%. Well, that's really not bad. Um, And so that's some portion of underlying return in your portfolio. That was gone from 2010 to 2020. Um, And hey, if this is a new normal regime in rates, maybe that's all it takes for value investing to be back. Uh, Maybe it's as simple as that. That's entirely possible. I'd be interesting to do an attribution of you know, a handful of discrete quote unquote value managers from 2000 through 2006, let's say, because you're right. Some of them were, were long short. Greenlight certainly was and is long short. I, I would bet that it, it was a relatively small contributor. I mean, obviously, if you were short in 2000, you were probably short tech stuff that crashed and you were long stuff that then had a great multi-year run. So those funds would have done tremendously well. But my guess is a lot of the long only funds that had the same long portfolio would have done pretty well through that whole period, regardless of their short book. But you're 100% right about the mechanics of you know how painful it's been to have any sort of short book in this zero interest rate environment where you were generally 
having to pay quite a bit to be short things, let alone earning some sort of positive carry on your short book, which, you know, it's it's lost now on a whole generation. But that was one of the primary <laughs> attributes of being short, like a diversified book of things was that you actually earned some carry. And, you know, it was it was kind of a nice uh a nice thing to have in your book over time. And it just became like banging your head against a brick wall for year after year after year. And that's why, I mean, that's probably the biggest market change. If he, if he wants to drill down into this argument is that there are really, really few long, short value oriented managers still left. Right. I mean that anybody on the short side, that herd has really been called. So that, that's, that's probably the biggest change of all. Yeah. And I want to give one more reason why I think it's coming back right now in a big way. Um, Small caps right now are as cheap relative to the S&P as they've been in our lifetimes outside of a very brief period in 2001. And I think a lot of uh, value investors from that era made most of their money in small caps, perhaps matured to the point where they were too big to dabble in small caps. But I think the opportunity set in small caps today is as great as I've seen in my career. Um, and so I think that's part of what's been missing the last five years in particular. That just wasn't the case. The small caps that were cheap, again, were relegated to like failed companies in the commodity space. And um, there weren't companies IPOing early in their life cycle. Today, hey, a bunch of them IPOed the last five years but they're down 80 to 90%. And so they were large caps, but they're small now. And so sub $5 billion market caps, there's there's way more opportunity now than I've seen as long as I've been doing this, um, which I think is fantastic. And I think is a big part of what uh, value managers have been missing. And that's where you find a lot of securities that aren't eligible or aren't in indices and aren't as driven by indices as um, some of the big caps. Um, and there's real dispersion. So yeah, I, I think value investing has a future and it's coming back. And maybe we're right on the precipice of better days because typically when someone prominent calls something dead, hey, you know, you get the re- <laughs> you get the re- reversal of that. Well, that's, that's very true. I mean, I, there is that effect of like you know the the famous fortune cover that equities are dead or you know whatever. That that's that's a good point. I don't think that's quite the same as this because I think he's speaking in a much more narrow construct that's relevant to what he's doing and not the broader market but and it's odd right because this isn't this isn't like the counter cyclical implication that that you know the the cover of fortune magazine or the cover of the economist or the wall street journal would it would imply so but i agree that's a funny it's a funny point maybe you're right there could be some ironic truth to that i suppose and what about small caps that was my bigger point <laughs> yeah no i look I, it's been super weird i think I have this number correct or this date correct. I think this is the first year. And look, the nice thing about this debate is that we can all agree around some relatively common sense, relatively accepted definitions of what makes up a small cap. Right? So this isn't quite as arbitrary and stupid as value versus growth. But I think this is the first year in the US that small caps have outperformed large caps year to date since 2016. Does that sound right? And can I add something else to that? Because in June, when the S&P made a low, I know it's below those lows now, and this is this week in intelligent investing. So this is something that happened this week. Um, in June, the Russell was down almost 10 points more than the S&P yeah. at right. those lows. And, and the reversed. Russell is now down less than the S&P. Right. So that means right. since the June lows, the Russell's recouped a lot of ground versus the S&P. And there's something to the fact that you know coming out of really tough markets, small caps tend to outperform. The whole way down, they do. small caps tend yeah. to underperform. And you know, it's small caps peaked about uh, 10 months before large caps did. And I think that was part of the frustration a lot of people, myself included, had last year. It's like you'd see these large caps keep going up and small caps are getting reamed. And it's partly because liquidity pulls there first, so sellers probably wash up there first. And that's right. happened in basically every cycle. So 10 points of recouped ground from June to today, I don't know. Maybe the market's telling us something. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. I think a big chunk of it could be dollar strength, right? Since that period, like the dollar's gotten so much stronger against other world currencies, it's really hurt large cap, mostly multinational companies, right? So, but anyway, your your point's a, a good one. And it, I think I'll have to double check that. Maybe we can put something in the show notes, but let's say this is the first year small caps have outperformed since 2016. Like that's another thing on the list that's really weird, right? That's real. That's a long run of pain 
for small caps to suffer. And, um, you know, the, these, it, it just kind of reinforces this notion that these giant omnipotent, supposedly omnipotent companies could just keep growing at these super high rates forever. And, you know, look, I'll, I'll be the first to say it. I was completely and totally dead wrong about most of the tech giants 10 years ago, right? I didn't own any of them 10 years ago. I obviously should have. I didn't think they could keep growing and reinvesting at the type of rates they needed to. And I'm talking about mostly Google to a lesser extent, Amazon. Um, but, you know, it, there was obviously some merit to my argument that growth becomes even harder the bigger you get. Um, but, you know, that was wrong for five or 10 years. Like I, I could have invested and done quite well. I'm not sure I ever had the personal room for error, the, the margin of safety, so to speak, to make those investments. But I think the point stands that this was a really crazy period where the big got bigger, the rich got richer, and it was really hard if you were on the other side of that. Again, I think that ties directly into why small caps have, uh, why, why value investors have had a hard go. If small caps have yeah. underperformed since 2016, I mean, you look at Einhorn's book right now, he has a third of his uh, US disclosed long book in a sub billion dollar market cap company. And he's got a bunch of small caps filling out the rest of the book. He's definitely way overexposed to small caps uh, relative to any other uh, kind of company. So you can imagine what sort of headwind that's been to generating returns as a value manager. Um, I think that's a big part of it. No, for sure. That's definitely been a huge, a huge part of it. And it's been, it's been painful for a lot of people. And, you know, that I, that's where I would take some argument that it, there's there's definitely some merit to this notion that no value investing is not dead like that kind of stuff that you know it would make some sense that there'd be a slight premium to small caps that could grow profitably over time rather than just you know the top 20% of the market dominated by the largest five tech companies or something right i mean that that's going to be really hard to sustain over a second decade i think we can all agree on that math right I'm betting on that. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, guys, this has been terrific. Um, I hope everyone listening enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much for the discussion. Thanks for listening. And we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.